My name is Helga Spitala, for those who don't know me. I am a member of the International Relations Team at GERNT, which is basically the European counterpart of ASRAM. And um, my focus area is the Arab region, hence my uh, very close collaboration and relationship with uh, Youssef and his team, and also Asia Pacific. And the title of this session now is Science, Communities and Endrance. So we are going to hear the voice of the users of ICT, the voice of representatives of specific user communities, on how technology and environment services support or have the potential to support um, basically their activities, uh, their collaborations, and also can help bring about informed policy decision making. So we have a um, very interesting uh, lineup of speakers. Unfortunately, we have just had a last minute uh, apology from uh, Dr. El Caras, uh, who is the um, uh, executive director of the Regional Center for Reusable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Unfortunately, he had to drop out, but he sends his best wishes. Um, I will introduce the speakers as we go along. And um, after each presentation, we should also have time for questions and answers. So I would encourage you to put your questions into the chat window. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the first speaker who happens to be one of my dear colleagues, Chris Atherton. So sorry, Chris, you are not the second one. You're now the first one, given that the first one actually dropped out. So Chris is a senior research engagement officer at uh, Géant, and um, his main focus area is providing support to the Earth observation and space related communities. And in the wider community, he is really known as a space guru. And I call him also with affection, our man on the moon. So Chris will now give us some insights into how Giant provides this vital support to user communities, to scientific uh, communities, including geoscience. So the floor is yours, Chris. That's great. Thank you very much, Helga. So I'm just going to display my screen and hopefully you can now see that. Um, yes. Yeah, perfect. OK, so um, I'd just like to, uh, well, first, firstly, uh, to say uh, thank you very much to Youssef and the conference organizers for extending the invitation to, to speak today. It's a huge privilege to be here. Uh, and thank you, Helga, for, for chairing this. Mm. Oh, Yes, you are mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Excellent. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> One moment. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, um, thank you very much uh, to Youssef and the conference organizers for extending the invite. Uh, it's a huge privilege to be here today, um, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. Uh, I'd also like to thank Helga uh, for chairing the, um, the session uh, and, and also uh, wish luck to uh, my uh, the rest of the speakers in this uh, panel session. Um, if you were in the previous session uh, about um, uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, my colleague Hendrik, he spoke about uh, who Giant is and what we do. Um, but for those who, who weren't there, just to provide a refresher, um, I'd like to start with who Giant is, uh, because I think that should hopefully provide the context uh, for the rest of the presentation. So Giant is a collaboration of European National Research and Education Networks, or NRENS. Um, our, our aim, our mission is to support the advancement of research, education and innovation on a global scale. Together, we deliver an information ecosystem of infrastructures that, um, that well, infrastructures and services used for communication, collaboration, and exchange of data, 
and also um, enables the means to access repositories, services and facilities for the use of the research and education community. Giant is a, uh, a, a as I say, a membership organization. There's over 40 different national research and education networks that spans all across Europe. But the origins of Giant go back to the, uh, to the early days of the internet, I would say. So back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, uh, there was a need to move academic uh, or, or rather research data from CERN, the um, particle collider uh, laboratory in, in, uh, well, that spans the border between Switzerland and France, to users around Europe uh, and to the rest of the world. Um, and the European Academic Research Network was created in collaboration with 19 different other NRENs at the time. And that then later developed over the years into Giant as it is now. Uh, and this network, the, this was what the, the original internet uh, by Tim Berners-Lee started on. Uh, so we can we can at least claim our heritage back, back to those early, early mm -hmm. days. But there was a reason why we needed to have a, a network dedicated to research and education. And that comes down to uh, the optimization. So if you compare, for example, um, commercial providers and you want to move data from one place to another, commercial providers or the, the way the commercial uh, networks typically operate is that they see a wave of data across the day. And then there's peaks and troughs and uh, the troughs normally coincide with uh, the night time. So like the, the periods when there's not, not much activity on, on the network uh, and, and the peaks occur during the daytime when most people are, are in work. Scientific research doesn't work in the same way. We send data out at many different times of the day. Sometimes the most important research is done during the middle of the night. And I'll talk a bit about that later uh, because I've, I've got a, an example from the, uh, the field of astronomy. But the other aspect of uh, commercial networks is that they they tend to uh, only provide the the amount of capacity that's necessary in order to deliver the service. Whereas NRENs don't do that. What we do is we over uh, well, we over provide the capacity, and this allows us to burst traffic because research data isn't uniform. Uh, it comes in uh, in, in waves uh, and, and big, huge waves. Uh, and then it kind of subsides through it. So uh, this uh, slide is an, uh, an experiment that was performed back in 2017, where we sent data across two uh, commercial links between Geneva and Canberra in Australia uh, to see just how much data we could send down uh, to, uh, to Australia uh, using the commercial network and then benchmark that against the RE network. And happily to say the RE networks considerably outperformed the commercial networks. Um, we we were able to achieve something close to the 10 gigabit a second, which the link was there for uh, or, or was uh, implemented compared with uh, the close to, uh, I think one of them got close to uh, two gigabit a second. Uh, that, that was the highest um, throughput achieved on the commercial network. So in terms of how that, um, how that affects researchers. Well, as one of the uh, presenters in the previous session said, they're suffering from a wave of uh, data. Uh, there's a lot of information that needs to be sent from the, uh, the sources of where the experiments are performed to the end users in order to, to do their work. There's ways in which we need to change in the way that we do our work but essentially that that issue still remains we still need to send a lot of data and um in comparison of uh well in comparison with those commercial networks it would have taken about um one and a half days roughly uh for the r e network to transfer uh, all of this uh data that we were uh sending at one time um I think it was uh, something like 100 terabytes worth of data in one go. Whereas for commercial networks, it would have taken nearly eight days, or at least the fastest commercial connection would have taken nearly eight days. So this shows that there's specific demands for researchers, uh, for research connectivity. And that's why we've got a specialist network or networks rather, because we operate like a family in a federated way across the world. 
And um, from those uh, early days of uh, sharing the data from CERN out to the rest of Europe and to some parts of the world, Giants expanded to become an off-for-profit membership organization representing, as I said, over 40 different national research and education networks just in the continent of Europe. But we connect those 40 odd countries out to the rest of the world to over 100 different um, countries and regions. Uh, So far, I think we connect about 140 countries globally uh, via our regional partners, uh, such as ASRAN, and we pass about a terabyte of data a second uh, on, on the network each day. We also connect the big research organizations that span multiple countries. So CERN, who I've mentioned before, the European Space Agency, EU METSAT, who provide weather data, the Square Kilometer Array, who do radio astronomy in um, South Africa and Australia. And we, we work with these partners from all around the world and in other world regions to help create a global research and education network. And, and this network, it's not just the physical layer, but it's also a community as well like in Africa, Asia, um, North Africa, and Latin America. And this way, we can pass this data freely between all of the different researchers and collaborators involved to benefit the advancement of science globally. Now, Giant's not just a network. Um, Hendrik showed this slide before. Um, th- this, uh, but Giant is also a project uh, funded by the European Union. Um, And it's made up of staff from the European member National Research and Education Networks and the Giant organization itself. And together we develop the services that the researchers need to perform, uh, sorry, that the researchers need to do their work. And um, what I wanted to do today is give you an example or two examples rather, one from geoscience, uh, uh, specifically earth observation, and another one from the world of astronomy, um, which I hope gives you an idea of the impact that being connected to an NREN can have. Um, And then later on, I'll talk about the future, about what we're actually trying to do at the moment. So um, for for geoscience, I think uh, firstly, we need a broader understanding about why it's important. Um, So really geoscience is there to, well, not just to, but does um, exist to tackle three global challenges. That's disaster and emergency response, sustainable development, and climate change. And these are globally addressed at a political and policy level through the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, which we heard about in the previous session, uh, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster and Emergency Response. But in order to tackle each one of these areas, we need data. We need data in order to validate what's going on. And um, one way that we do that is we use Earth observation, so satellites from space, in order to monitor the Earth. Um, and this uh, this data um, can well is 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 used by um, people such as ECMWF. Uh, ECMWF track climate change as part of the Copernicus project, and um, this is the long term average weather pattern uh, of of the Earth. And ever since 1997, as a global community, we have agreed that um, the the change in average surface temperature is a direct result of human human made uh, emissions. And this has a direct impact on things like sea level height, which now threatens low lying countries such as the Maldives or even the Netherlands, where I'm speaking to you from today. And anywhere really where there's a coastline. Um, all this has an impact on what we leave our future generations, uh, which is why it's it's so important. Uh, an example of uh, support, one of the global challenges uh, is uh, with um, the Dutch Meteorological Agency and UMATSAT. So um, KNMI, the, the Dutch Meteorological Agency, they, uh, they get um, wind data from UMATSAT. UMATSAT operates satellites in space that beam down the data to the um, main processing facility in Germany. And we help connect that processing facility, not just uh, from the ground stations, but to be able to disseminate that data that they've then processed out to the rest of the scientific community, to the likes of uh, KNMI and to uh, ECMWF, the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Um, And these weather satellites provide raw data for weather and climate models Um, And it's through these models 
that we're able to understand the change of of uh, of the climate on on our planet and also it contributes to uh, meteorological information so being able to predict the weather which is a a, a huge um uh, achievement if you think that um 10 years ago we we'd only be able to predict the day in advance whereas now through all of the different models and uh, advancements we're able to predict a, a few weeks ahead in the future uh, with a reasonable degree of accuracy uh, what the weather would likely be but again because of climate change those models are now being impacted uh, so there's a a, a a dynamic emerging where uh, we need to do more in order to um to account for the changes in um, climate change uh, with um things like uh, average weather patterns not only um do uh we use satellite data for monitoring um the weather but we can also use it to monitor pollution so this uh, image is from uh, Sentinel-5P, uh, which is one of the Copernicus satellites, and it shows uh, nitrogen dioxide, which has been emitted into the atmosphere uh, over uh, a few months. Uh, I think, well, it's between April and September 2018. Uh, and you can see the concentrations of where um, the nitrogen dioxide is shown up, and that's as a result of human-made emissions. Uh, and with this kind of data, we can now see where the emissions are from over time uh, and we can share this data with policy makers and decision makers so that they can tackle the the challenges uh, and, and uh, focus on the uh, the emitters of the pollution to reduce uh, that pollution over time so these are a real um, concrete examples of how information that's derived from research can benefit society globally and also help policy makers to understand what's going on on our planet and the sharing of this data is made possible with researchers because of national research and education networks. 80% um, of uh, the users of the Copernicus data are from the NREN or, or are from NREN connected uh, infrastructures and the rest of the users get their data via uh, commercial commodity internet. And the data produced by the Sentinel uh, or sorry, the Copernicus satellites doesn't just help with uh, climate change, uh, but it can also look at the effects um, or the after effects of earthquakes. It can look at marine life. Um, again, the atmosphere and weather prediction uh, changes to the use in land, sustainable agriculture, and as well, the, the, the three challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier. Now, one thing that we've done in particular this last year is we've, uh, we've just been um, working for many, many years to set up a cable between Europe and Latin America. And it's a direct connection for the very first time. And that now allows us to, uh, to set up a, um, a, 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 like a, a private network that allows us to share Copernicus data with uh, regional mirrors in Latin America so that the data can flow freely and quickly across this new link. Uh, whereas before it would um, it, it potentially could go uh, anywhere across our network. Um, we're now able to focus and direct where this traffic goes so that we can deliver uh, near real-time data, for example, about the weather, about um, disasters, about anything as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that the, uh, the, the researchers who need to process this data in the um, cloud facilities in Latin America can do so uh, at speed. Um, and it won't take them eight days to download 100 terabytes. It only takes them a, a day. Um, this link that we've just put in is 100 gig rather than 10 gigabit per second. So it's um, 10 times quicker than uh, the experiment that I showed you the data for before. Um, and it's, it's through these advancements in the underlying infrastructure that we are helping to support not just the um, research and education community, but working towards addressing the sustainable development goals, uh, climate change, and also um, disaster and emergency response. Um, so that, I hope, gives you an idea about what's going on in uh, the, the, the world of uh, Earth observation. Um, and uh, on the right, there's the first image that was ever sent over uh, the link. Um, so if you'd like to download this in the notes in the slides, you'll be able to click on the link.
Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about next is not so much the network, although this will feature in it, uh, but um, one of the services that NRENs offer uh, that's a bit more unique, and that's called Edugain. Now, the story I'm about to tell is uh, about um, uh, an event that happened in 2017. It was just after I started working for Giant. Um, and uh, this picture that I've, I'm showing here is the European Gravitational Observatory called Virgo. Uh, and this is located in Italy, not far from Florence. Um, a gravitational wave detector is able to detect um, waves in space time. So the gravitational waves that hit our planet from huge explosions um, are, are now able to be detected uh, on the ground. Um, now, this site is not only connected to the local NREN, uh, GAR, which is the, the Italian NREN, it's also using Edugain. Now, Edugain is a single sign-on service, and it allows users to use one username and password to access a whole raft of services and tools that they need online and also on, on uh, machines so it gives you access a non-web access to machines too and um the the idea it will not the idea rather um this system requires participating universities and institutes to manage their own users but it reduces the burden on the actual research project itself um by uh, by allowing the, uh, the the users to um, log in and be identified by their home institution. For universities and research institutes, it enables access to a wider range of services than would be available locally or nationally. And once set up, there's no extra administrative burden on the identity providing institution. It's more on the uh, um, a, a quick exchange of uh, metadata uh, which is automated that allows the service to run smoothly. Coming back to Virgo, um, as of February 2021, there are more than 650 members representing 119 institutions in 14 different countries uh, for, uh, from places like France, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, and elsewhere. And we're going to go through one example of where this collaboration using Edugain helped. So, um, Back in August 2017, uh, Virgo started a trial working with similar detectors in the United States called LIGO. Um, the work to integrate those detectors and sync up their operations took about a year to complete. Edugain was a key part of this uh, because it, um, as part of this integration, it allows over 1,500 researchers to access the various wikis, document catalogs, event databases, and data investigation tools that are used to perform research into gravitational waves. Uh, and along with Edugain, the detectors themselves were synced up um, and allowed to, uh, to, to work together. And uh, I think it was uh, three days after the first um, wave uh, or first detection that they had, um, they, uh, they were able to pick up for the very first time a really unique and strange event. Now this wave, uh, because we're using three detectors that are located around the world. Uh, the scientists were able to detect where the wave hit. So right in the center of the screen in yellow, it says GW170817. This gravitational wave hit the earth just off the coast of East Africa. And um, not long after uh, that event uh, occurred, uh, they received uh, a notification on the astronomical um, circular. Uh, and this was from a satellite in orbit called um, Fermi. And what I'm showing you here is the actual wave hitting the Earth right there. And this was a gamma ray burst that was received by the Fermi uh, satellite in orbit. So it was about two seconds after the uh, the gamma ray burst, uh, sorry, the uh, gravitational wave hit, that the gamma ray burst was detected by satellites in orbit. Uh, and this was validated by the uh, the, um, uh, the uh, European Space Agency satellite who was also uh, in, in space called Integral. So when this happened, um, the, uh, the researchers, uh, um, Virgo and LIGO, 
uh, noticed the the message, and so oops, and so um, they uh, unprecedentedly um, announced the detection of a gravitational wave on the same system that um, LIGO, uh, sorry, the um, Integral and the Fermi uh, satellite uh, automatically announced their signal on. Because the Earth's turning, uh, the, a few hours had uh, passed by this point. Um, and to make matters more complicated, the search area where this gravitational wave had come from in the sky was actually close to where the sun was. So um, astronomers in Latin America were then woken up, or, or rather um, were made aware of this uh, really strange event that had just occurred, and uh, waited for dusk. And they only had about a one hour window after the sun had set to try and find where this uh, th this uh, gravitational wave and gamma ray burst had come from. And this started the largest ever astronomical astronomical survey um, in humanity has ever seen. It took about 10 or well, nearly 11 hours uh, from when the gravitational wave hit the planet to when the source was found in an area of sky that's about 150 times the area of a full moon. Uh, and the first uh, telescope uh, to locate the source was an optical telescope called SWOPE, which is in Latin America. And it was able to dig back through images um, that it had taken just after dusk uh, and compare them with existing images taken from the Hubble Space Telescope of that same part of the sky. And what they found was this little dot uh, in, in the top right hand side um, this was actually uh, an explosion, and uh, the explosion was so big, it lasted for nine days. Um, and around 4,000 astronomers, uh, about one third of the world's um, astronomical community, took part in the surveys on, on this, uh, this explosion. And uh, what they discovered uh, was that it was uh, a two or a neutron star, a binary neutron star, I should say, um, colliding with one another. So two neutron stars that are spinning around that combine and blow up, and that's called a kilonova. Um, it, it was uh, it was covered by about or uh, observed by about seventy different observatories in all seven continents um, and in space, uh, and it covered uh, observations across. The vast majority of the most significant elements of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, this event was also the beginning of a new form of science called multi-messenger astronomy. Um, and the discovery was made possible because of the NREN community, not just the network, which all of the data passed across, but also the tools that they used to collaborate were supported by Edugain because they were able to uh, log in with their institution's username and password in order to access the tools to analyze uh, the, the data that was being produced from these experiments. Um, so that I hope gives you an idea of the power of this community, the, these uh, tools and services and infrastructures that we, um, th that we build uh, and provide to the global research and education community. And Giant's involved in a number of innovative new projects um, so there's one that I'm working on at the moment, which is called Geolab. Uh, it's not yet built, uh, but the, the cable is in place. And this is a uh, an unused submarine fiber optic cable that uh, runs out uh, from Madeira out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it is uh, it runs side by side an existing telecoms cable. And the idea is that we can uh, deploy uh, different types of scientific equipment uh, on this unused fiber uh, to turn it into a research instrument. Um, so this is an example of, uh, or it, it's um, the the people who built it were saying that this is the first permanent infrastructure dedicated to science embedded in a commercial telecom system, um, which we're very proud to be associated with. And this was part of the cable, uh, the Ellerlink um, and Bella cable that was built between uh, Europe and Latin America that I mentioned before. Um, so uh, this, um, yeah, the, how it works is basically the, the unlit um, fiber optic cable um, can be lit up with uh, signal generating equipment such as uh, a distributed acoustic sensor. And this turns the, um, the, the cable itself into a, a microphone in a way, uh, but in a, in a reduced level. Um, but all of the data that's generated, or hopefully 
is generated from from this uh, infrastructure would then be streamed back uh, via the, uh, the, the the same telecoms cable that runs parallel to it uh, back to Portugal and then out uh, to the rest of the world via Giant. Um, and so the types of scientific use cases we, we could apply this for are mainly around uh, the earth or geoscience uh, community. So looking at seismology, anthropogenic movements, volcanology, benthic flows, but it could also be used uh, in climate change research or in any other type of research uh, involving geoscience. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, we've already uh, run a pilot um, we've got some initial results with the distributed acoustic sensor. And here you can see uh, the part of the cable that um, reaches the beach and runs into the, uh, in, into the sea um, or into the ocean rather. And um, these waves are actually uh, the waves of the ocean lapping up against the seashore uh, over time. Um, so uh, the, yeah, th we hope that this will be the start of a new area of research or research support uh, by helping pave the way uh, of utilizing existing telecoms infrastructure directly for scientific research. But there's still quite a lot of work to do in order to make this system fully live. Alongside this, and um, I'd like to thank Youssef for mentioning this before, um, Giant, uh, Azran and Red Clara have been working together over the last few months, um, going back to COP26 where we had uh, Youssef Luis uh, Cardenas from Red Clara and Eric Hauser from, from Giant um, talking together about the values uh, that the research and education community can bring to support uh, climate action. We followed this work up um, at the recent Internet Governance Forum meeting um, where we, we talked in a bit more detail about uh, what we can practically, practically do to collaborate and work together um to to support uh scientific collaboration and what we've now got uh, is uh the, the foundations of a declaration uh which has got such core elements as assistant scientific collaboration as a founding principle a focus on synchronization of platforms capacity building engagement with user communities opening access policy uh, sorry open access policies including equitability of access increasing diversity and, and quite a few other points as well. Um, and this is all to go to support uh, the um, what we see are the three big challenges globally um, and, and also our, our own uh, individual organizations, policy directives to try and um, help and support uh, scientific collaboration globally. Um, and from this, I hope you've got uh, an understanding now about the impact that NRENs have um, on uh, research globally and what direction we're looking to move in to support scientific communities. Um, and because of the, the research and education networks, um, well, as my, uh, my colleague Hendrik said in a previous slide, we're, we're, we're like a family. Um, and one of the ethoses as a family is uh, by being devoted to supporting and boosting scientific endeavor globally in support of these global challenges. So I'd like to say thank you very much um, for your attention and uh, over to you, Helga. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you ever so much, Chris, for really passionately demonstrating that our community has a reason to exist. So you not just outlined the what we are doing, but also the why, and I always love that because there is, I, I always tend to name it a suicidal mandate that our community also embraces because by facilitating these global uh, uh, scientific endeavors, we ultimately help have an impact on the man, woman and child on the street. So thank you very much. And I also like that you stress the fact that our community is much more than connectivity. It's not just connectivity, it's uh, value added services that enhance collaboration such as Edogain. So thank you very much. We have a couple of questions here. Uh, so probably, um, Chris, if you could just clarify for our co speaker, um, uh, Andres, is the Giant network based on separate hardware? 
Uh, well, we we have um, we have dedicated fibers across Europe, uh, and we also um, lease capacity on uh, submarine cables um, out to the rest of the world. Um, but uh, essentially, it's um, the 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 internet or the, the the research and education internet is is based on a set of um, uh, protocols and uh, impl uh, separate implementations of federated um, domains. So it, it there's it, it's uh, we use lots of different hardware uh, to achieve this, um, both um, DWDM equipment, which is optical. Uh, generating equipment as well as network connectivity equipment um and i'm going into a lot of detail for what should really be a very simple answer <laughs> but uh yes that there's um uh i'd say yes it, it probably is based the easiest way to describe it will be yes it's based on separate hardware thank you and then we have a question from Mr. Mahmoud Amama, and I think that is both to Youssef and Chris as representative of Geant. It says it's a great source of international cooperation. Does the, uh, do the institutes of in Arab countries can they interact with these sources through ASREN? I, I think uh, Youssef would be the, the the most appropriate person yes. to answer this. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass the floor to to Youssef. So thank you. I'm not a speaker, I'm not panelist, so I should not receive your questions. However, I would answer that uh, uh, for the sake of the question. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Mohammed Amara, and I wish to contact you in person to further discuss this. Uh, so I will uh, type my email just immediately after the, uh, my responding to your question. Absolutely, we are here to enable this. Uh, we are there. We are. Uh, uh, we have. What, that, that's why I'm trying to avoid answering the question. But uh, the mm -hmm. answer is yes. We are building infrastructure among the Arab countries and to take them beyond the, uh, the Arab region to the rest of the world. Uh, so this is my answer, and we can take it further in uh, in details. The answer is yes. I will write down my email so that please send me an email and we can, uh, I, I think we have your email, but however, uh, as a registrant, but I will I'll type it for the sake of uh, making, making it easy for you. So I will type my email down uh, the chat and please, after that, please contact me so that we can discuss this further. Uh, I want, don't want to take more uh, the valuable uh, uh, speech presentation of our colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Youssef, for following up and offline. Thanks again, Chris. So from the wider space, we are now uh, zooming back into planet Earth as such. And uh, we have Dr. Andres Enrique Gustavo Ruth here, or Eric Ruth, I never know. <laughs> and um, he is from the Biodiversity Institute of Misiones in uh, Argentina. He will outline the activities and the missions of that institute, which, not by coincidence, is located in northeast of Argentina. And uh, this is basically the region which harbors the country's only remaining subtropical forest. So what better location for biodiversity studies? So uh, in the background, I'd also like to mention, we have uh, one of his colleagues, Dr. Manuel Grassi, who is then also available for questions should they pop up. So the floor is yours, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope you hear me well. So uh, I would first of all like to thank uh, Youssef uh, for the kind invitation and and Asran for inviting us to present and also Helga this this uh, session so I'm going to try to share my uh, my my presentation and uh, hopefully it works.
Do you see something changing? Not at the moment, Eric. Uh, so I'm trying to share. Uh, we also lost your video. So here I'm back. Yes, you're back. And I'm trying to share my, but it doesn't give me my authorization to. to I don't see my, my. There is a part in the left. Choose the fourth mm -hmm. icon. Share screen. Yes, I I do that. Yes, and share the entire screen, the entire window. The which one? The first option, entire window. Entire window. Yes, and I'm doing that. Do you see something now? Not yet. Nope. Um, so um, um, maybe there is a solution to this. Can you send us your presentation? Thank you. Have we got your presentation? Um, you haven't got that. So what I'm going to do is you postpone me i will and ask someone else to present first i will send it to someone if you yes. forward the mail yes yes I mean if you could put in the uh in the chat window your email address yes then eric can forward the presentation and then we basically operate it from your location yasmin Okay, so then I think we move on to the next presentation then, which takes us to the scientific world of linguistics and ontology. Birzeit University in Palestine has created and is hosting the largest linguistic ontology of the Arab language, which is impressive. And we have here um, Mustafa Jarar, who is Professor of Artificial Intelligence at Birzeit University. And he will talk us through Arabic natural language understanding as a sustainable artificial intelligence research. So the floor is yours, Mustafa. Yeah, thank you, Helga. I will also share my screen. I hope it's going to work. Hmm. I guess I found the problem. Okay. I found the problem that my colleague didn't, <laughs> was unable to share. Uh, just a second. Again, if alternatively, we have a copy of your presentation, if my colleagues has asked when you have that. Uh, Let's... Do you see yeah. my screen? Yes, we do. Perfect. Mission completed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm really happy to be with you. I hope also we meet uh, in person. Uh, I'm Mustafa Jarrar from Birzeit University. 
so I will actually present you uh, something. I will not be technical. I will stay on the, on the surface, at least at the linguistic level. And my conclusion that I will reach at the end is that we need your help, you, to keep us uh, have access to e-infrastructure. And I will show you a case where, where this is needed. So, uh, we are witnessing now the, uh, the fourth revolution, which is called artificial intelligence. And this is an opportunity, really opportunity for developing countries to exist, to compete, to make impact, to, to be, and also to make money. And my story with artificial intelligence is from the angle of the language, is that uh, how we can invest on the language, in Arabic, at, uh, for example, Arabic here. But it can be, what, I'm, what I will talk is actually, uh, it can be applied to any language. So I see Arabic as industry. I don't see Arabic as now culture here. I see Arabic as sustainable research and development uh, from the research and development uh, angle. So every time we use our mobile, we actually use uh, applications that use natural language. When you call, when you ask Siri to call somebody, when you set up an alarm, when you play music, when you do anything, when you write documents at work. So every time we use some components that sometimes we don't know that they use artificial intelligence and that uses the language. For Arabic, why Arabic here? Because Arabic actually is a huge, huge market. We are talking about 400 million users as a first language and about 1.6 billion users that use somehow uh, the Arabic language. And of course, there are other communities uh, and companies and governments that need also Arabic uh, or to use Arabic for some reasons. So let me uh, say, what if we don't support natural language? What if we don't really support uh, uh, Arabic in applications, in apps? So what the impact will be on our education, on our culture, economy, politics, even with people with special needs, sometimes they need to talk or to, to see something. So this is all is very important. The problem with natural language typically is that, well, with English, of course, everything is almost done, almost, almost. But with other languages like Arabic, they call, we call them low resource languages where uh, we need many resources to, 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 to be able to develop smart applications that understand the language. We need dictionaries, we need thesauri, we need uh, ontologies, we need uh, many things. In order to build applications, uh, what we call them information retrieval and search, uh, translation, uh, spelling checkers, uh, grammar checkers, uh, if you remember now, Grammarly, is, is, uh, people use it uh, to correct their uh, words. So in many types of things, many types of applications. So in Arabic, we don't have enough resources, not only for humans, but for machines. So this is what we are, what we focus. At Birzeit University, we try to solve this problem by collecting digitizing uh, dictionaries, linking them together and providing them to the uh, community. This is a picture <laughs> of me in the library carrying uh, lexicons that we actually, we all, we digitize. And this is the picture of my university, especially in the spring, it's a very beautiful campus here. So what we did at Birzeit University, we did first, uh, digitize 150 lexicons and imagine if a lexicon is really something huge and it's multilingual by the way it's not only Arabic Arabic we, we are talking about Arabic English Arabic German Arabic French Arabic Spanish 
uh, with many languages. Uh, all connected, so we try to connect the lexical entries of all dictionaries. And another parallel, parallel project is called the Arabic ontology. The Arabic ontology is a dictionary, is a new type of dictionary that we are building, a new type of dictionary. It's not a dictionary. This dictionary is built in a way that machines can understand the semantics, not the lexic, not the morphology, the semantics of the uh, or the meanings of the words. We also work with dialects. We build corpora to uh, uh, to for the machines to understand the dialect, and all linked with, uh, together in a, something called big list li linguistic datagram. This is some pictures we want some uh, awares of this work. Uh, so just quickly, uh, we put we built a lexographic search engine to show to, to you. So you uh, this is a this is a picture where you put a word and this is for humans. Uh, you search dictionary. So we actually built this search engine on top of all dictionaries. Uh, the this this after we build it so we have the database of the search engine is actually the largest uh, lexicographic database at least for arabic uh, it contains many types of dictionaries glossaries thesauri etc and with many domains so it's not pure linguistic uh, uh, data it's also scientific uh, dictionaries uh, business dictionaries and so on uh, it's free to be able, if you search on, even in Google, you will find us almost in the first or the second page. Just type anywhere, actually, in Arabic and sometimes in English. We, we come in the, in, in, at the beginning. It's accessible through ABIs, and it's done over about nine years. It does not stop. We started in 2010, actually, uh, or even 2009. Uh, and we are, we, it's, it's, it's a growing now, right now. And we do this without funding. So I tr try to crowdsource this type of work. Uh, uh, so I want to say is that after we launched the, 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 the search engine, we found that actually it is the only language, the, the only language that have a search engine for its dictionaries is Arabic now. So <laughs> we didn't know this at the beginning. So we are happy. So, whatever we do, we try to put it somehow accessible to people, either through uh, interface on the web or through uh, what we call it uh, ABI. So it's or, or accessible through RISTful ABIs or something if you want to download or something like this. All the data. So, so this is now the search engine. Now the Arabic ontology. The Arabic ontology is a tree. Three of meaning. So this is a meaning, which is entity, anything in the world, and then object, and then occurrence, dependent entity, abstract information entity, and so on. And you can expand the tree, and every node in the tree represents a meaning. So it's a classification of the meanings. Uh, this is made to enable machine to understand the semantics. This is the top level, only the top levels of three. So we say every entity is either an object or occurrence. And if it's an object, then they have physical object or social object. If it is phys physical object, then uh, organism, an uh, anatomical structure, virus, and so on. So every everything have a place in the ontology. This ontology is also linked with something called wiki data. So wiki data is actually is the graph behind Wikipedia. So Wikidata, which means that if the ontology is linked, it means that uh, we can access the world knowledge through Arabic uh, or Arab or sorry, as Arabic knowledge graph. And then we can build chatbots or uh, question answering applications to answer any question because we can query the Wikipedia or the Wikidata through the ontology. Uh, the third thing I want to show is the what we call Kurras. Kurras is the a corpora for uh, dialect. 
so actually, uh, what we did is that we collect text, we annotate it, we take every word in the corpus, we segment the word, we describe every segment of the word, so suffixes, prefixes, and so on, and the stem, so and the type, the part of the speech, uh, the semantics, and so on, the lemma. So, and we also uh, put it online, people can use it. Actually, we built this for machines, but we found that the users are the, uh, uh, the people who learn Arabic as a second language. Uh, so they search, even they can search in English and they can, they get the word in, uh, in the dialect, you know. And you see here, Bakullak, which means uh, I am saying to you, so Bakullak is, Ba is, Brook Bart, then the, the A is IV, uh, and so on. So I don't want to go into details. And the meaning in English, and so on. Okay. So we do, we build resources, linguistic resources like this. So the idea is to connect these resources. And there is a W3C, uh, W3C uh, standard called Lemon. And everything is connected using this uh, this standard. Uh, uh, so the as you see here in this graph, so every graph, this is a, not only Arabic. This is all languages. What's being done in the world is that every dictionary, every lexical resource is connected with another lexical resource. So every entry in a dictionary is linked with another entry in another dictionary. So people are linking together and this graph is growing uh, very much. And we try also to link Arabic uh, to this uh, lexographic world knowledge. Okay, so this is uh, so what we want to do at the end. So this is a sentence. I, I know it's not important that you don't know English, uh, Arabic, but it's okay. This is actually even hard for people who know Arabic. This is written in dialect. So you say, خمس دكايك بوصل القمر. So this is a dialect. دكايك is not an Arabic word. It's a dialect word written like this. And so say, five minutes, I will reach the moon. So it's a, So this is a word. And we say this is... Sentence in MSA, MSA is the standard Arabic or the dialect. So we take a word like this. We can, this, what I'm talking is that we did this automatically. So the, the kaik, it becomes the kaik, and then it's a, the lemma is the kika, it's minute, and the number is brular, the gender is. Uh, feminine and so on. So the kamar, the same. So the moon here. So this is the lama and so on. And we link this with the, now with the, onto, with the, uh, with our lexographic database and with the ontology. So this is the lama, the card of the lama. So this is the, so we, we started from here, the word. So this is the surface of the word. And then we understand this word. We go to the dictionary, we link it with the dictionary, and we link it with the morpholo with the with the ontology. So every word is goes from the dialect to the morphology level, the Arabic standard morphology level to the ontology, and we don't stop here. So after we do the ontology, then we link, because this is now linked, I, th I talked with this before, this is linked with the uh, ling uh, linguistic data graph of the world. It's called uh, cloud, linguistic uh, open uh, da data cloud. So this is how we do, we understand uh, words from morphology to uh, semantics. Just uh, to show you a little bit, so this is a, a, a something called word sense disambiguation, where we have also a word even in even in standard Arabic. So it's a sentence 
called Qasida min Uyun Shir. So this is a word. Uh, it's not doesn't mean I. So a word can have one word can have several meanings. We want machine. We want the using artificial intelligence to understand or to decide which of this meaning is the correct one. So take for example in in English the word uh, table or the word yeah table table means uh, the disk table means the data structure table means people sitting on the table and so on so which if you have a sentence that have the word table so we want to understand which of these meanings is actually uh, uh, is the target so we did this with artificial intelligence. I will. I promised I will not go to, into technical details. Uh, so using our uh, lexographic search, uh, lexographic database, uh, because we have all meanings. Uh, so we did this with accuracy of uh, eighty-four percent. So eighty-four percent we are correct in deciding uh, the meaning. That's all I want to say. But. My conclusion is that in order to do this work, we need help. What, what type of help that you can provide us? So this type of work, in order to conduct this experiment, we have to run uh, to what we call to train machine uh, over many, many, many uh, days. So the, uh, we need huge servers in order to run such experiments. And without these experiments, we cannot do anything. So therefore, I want to say in this conference that universities, especially in the developing countries, need help, especially the what we call the computational infrastructure to, to conduct AI experiments. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Um, very impressive as i said i have myself a background in linguistics so but i only followed up to a certain point then it became very <laughs> overwhelming but in a good sense so it inspires me to to learn more about it i trust you are in touch with yourself in terms of um identifying in more concrete terms how our community can assist you. So I would encourage you to um, to continue this dialogue and also with our colleagues we are engaging with in Palestine, you know, who are trying at the moment to relaunch also a Palestinian network, again, National Research and Education Network. We know it takes time. We know uh, the situation and the conditions at times are not easy or complex but palestine was connected in the past to the global research and education networking family as chris said family i like that rather than fabric so um we will get there as well and in terms of also virtual machines and so on and access to that i'm sure also asrin can assist Thank you. So, are there any other questions? No, apart from great job, great job, uh, Dr. Jara, apparently. So thank you again. Okay, so I wonder whether uh, Eric has been successful uh, in setting up his presentation or in, I, I don't know what the latest is. Are we going to share it locally or? Oh, perfect. Okay. So over to you eric so thank you helga again let's try this uh, what i'm going to do is uh, yasmin is probably then going to help me with passing the slides and i'm going to express that directly when i want a slide to go uh, passing by again so what I'm going to talk about, as Helga said, is about a, a small province in the north, northern eastern part of Argentina, which is a biodiversity haven. So in the next slide, uh, you will see 
So if you can pass the next slide, then you will see the province. If you look on the, this is a simple Google Earth uh, picture. So it's a screenshot uh, and you see that everything is green, but uh, what is within the yellow lines, which is Misiones is greener than the rest of the surrounding area. That means essentially that Paraguay and Brazil, which are surrounding uh, Misiones, are cultivating soybean, whereas we keep our uh, forest, uh, which is a remnant of the Atlantic forest, the big Atlantic forest, and we call it the Paranense forest due to one of the big rivers. We have uh, uh, safeguarded and kept the Paranense forest and that makes our province greener than the rest. We are surrounded on the west by Paraguay, on the north, east and east and southeast by Brazil. So essentially the borders are international. So out of 1000 kilometers of borders, 90% are international. This small border on the southwest is um, facing towards Argentina and the province of Corrientes. So in the northern part, you have um, north northern eastern part, you have the location of our institute, which I cannot show you now because I don't have the pointer, but uh, it's written, if you have good eyes, you see it's written Alto Paraná in, uh, in Par the Paraguay area, within the area here. Uh, let's see if I can, I don't know if you see the pointer, no. There, there you see Alto Paraná, and within the yellow lines, you have uh, on the northeast, you have Iguazu, which is the Iguazu Falls, and where you have the location of our institute. So, some data and basic data on the, uh, on the province comes in the next slide. So I call this Misiones Basics. You have some pictures here of uh, what is the biodiversity in the province. You have uh, a tree here, which is a rosa tree, which is uh, Lapacho Rosado, it's called. This is ferns, uh, ar arborescent ferns. And this is on the, uh, the, the picture the lowest picture is um, a shot of the Iguazu Falls. So Misiones Basics is essentially 1% of the continental surface of Argentina, and that's 30,000 kilometers square, square kilometers of province. It has a small population of 1.3 million inhabitants, and roughly 50% is covered with forests. And of these forests, uh, this surface, two thirds are protected by law in one or the other way. Uh, Argentina's biodiversity is found to 52% in this province. So it's the most biodiverse and most rich province in Argentina in terms of a species representation, and that concerns both trees and animals. And it has been called the biodiversity capital of Argentina in, in 2018, and that was declared by the nation by law. And the reason why we are so diverse is, of course, the Paranans forest, which has been declared also as a biodiversity hotspot. Our, <clears throat> how we safeguard the Paranans Forest is essentially a legal effort that has been going on since 1974 and some more than 120 laws have been promulgated to, pr 
protect the forest in one way or the other. There is a political will to put to push biodiversity and protect the nature, uh, which is shown by the creation of the first ecology minister in the country. Minister in the country was created in 84, 2018. This institute was, was in, inaugurated and it's the first one and unique in its kind in the continent. <clears throat> and last year in 2020, uh, the province created the first climate ministry climate change minister in the continent. And finally, as I mentioned, and you see on the right of the text, which says Iguazu waterfalls, it's the seventh natural wonder uh, declared by the UNESCO. So in the next slide. So the question is, why is Misiones so highly biodiverse? And uh, Let's take it as a children's story. Once upon a time, there was the Atlantic Forest. The Atlantic Forest, before 1900, covered large parts of uh, South America. It was the second largest forest compared, as compared to the Amazonian forest. From 1900s onwards, then uh, came the immigration and they, uh, cut most of the trees. And in the next slide, you will see the effect that human expansion had. If you can show the next slide, you can see what happened to the forest. What happened to the forest here in green, you see the original extension or the assumed original extension of the inner Atlantic forest, because you have the coastal and the inner Atlantic forest. And in 1900, uh, nothing much happened to 1940. 1970, suddenly there was a huge change and to, to, to 2000, almost all the inner Atlantic forest, the Atlantic forest has almost disappeared except for the green spot you see in Misiones. And in 1900, it was 80 million hectares. And only in, and in 2000, in 2000, only 5% remains. And it's probably less today. And what we have in, in, in Misiones is the biggest continuous remnant of the interior Atlantic forest. Can I have the next slide? And this is just to show you, uh, and this is, from a, a publication where you see in red those spots which are the most exposed and you see that Misiones is one of the most exposed uh, and critically endangered spots in the in this continent and why why is it so because you have ex pressure points and those are the expanding agriculture or frontier cattle industry, human over-exploitation, poverty. Poverty is a huge problem because who, what do you sell? You sell logs to make fire, to produce energy. You go into the forest and you poach the, the forest. Uh, poaching does not necessarily mean that you just kill animals. You could also cut trees. There is an increased um, population, population increase in the province. They're young, uh, it's a young province with a young population. So the habitat increases and they burn the forest in order to build their houses. The climate change, of course, influences us. And as I mentioned, there is an increased demand for wood, the poaching, and there you have also in terms of animals, you have traffic accidents and we have what is a general problem, which is the, which are the exotic species. So next slide. This is just to tell you, show you that uh, I'm not going to repeat all the numbers because it would be very, very boring, but uh, 
we have made the, the accounting for the different species and we can therefore guarantee that it's 52 percent this is just to uh, show that we are have made our due diligence next slide please so what does it mean to keep and safeguard the forest it has a cost the cost of lost opportunities i would say it's quite clear that if we compare we compare with with our neighbors neighboring countries we have lost the opportunity to cultivate soybean so these uh, 1.6 million hectares uh, means that farmers lose almost 50 thousand million Argentinian pesos a year. No, that doesn't, doesn't tell you a lot because we have a huge infl inflation, but it still it's a, it's a huge number. There is a loss of fiscal income of uh, 70,000 million pesos a year. Now coming to something which is more understandable, which is dollars, US dollars. So in, in 20 years, we have a loss of 9 billion US dollars just for keeping the forest. And the province allocates $10 million US dollars a year to keep nature and biodiversity and to compare how we perform in, uh, com com in comparison with the world. The word preservation lies at 12% and we preserved 48% of our, our forests. So next slide, please. So what the take home message is that we do it essentially ourselves and it's, it's, quite, it's quite expensive. So now let's, let me describe uh, this institute. This institute is, the acronym stands for Instituto Misionero de Biodiversidad, which is IMIBIO. It's uh, the Misiones Biodiversity Institute, which was created by law uh, in 2018, and it's a decentralized entity uh, from the government. It has a statue of being ministerial, but it's decentralized and depends on the governor directly. The vision we have is to be an international and regional reference center for scientific studies of, on biodiversity and of knowledge transfer. So we provide, promote a wide, friendly and holistic vision of biodiversity and we approach uh, ourselves, we align ourselves with the Green Deal of Europe. Our purpose is to conserve and restore, restore biodiversity, enhance the value of biodiversity and then ecosystem services by increasing the quality of life promote policies and legal instruments for the conservation and regulation of biodiversity services, and study the biodiversity service, the biodiversity within the Paranans forest, which is Misiones, uh, and study the species interaction and ecosystem homeostasis. I'm using homeostasis because I like the word. I'm a medic by training, so I like homeostasis as a word it means equilibrium in reality. So we also want to identify and de detect the ecosystem stress factors and their impact and how they interact, which is a system biology study. Finally, the transfer part of it is to identify and respond to so societal needs. Uh, and as an example, we have scientists and as upon demand by the governor and the government of the province. We set up a COVID-19 diagnostic lab in a couple of months, and we are the second lab, reference lab, with high, uh, high, what's that? Uh, high degree of technology in, in the province. So in the next slide, this is how we work. Uh, 
we have defined strategic assets along which we we define our projects and we define our strategic axis as biodiversity and science, biodiversity and health, and biodiversity and society. Those are the three, uh, I would say, scientific axes. The biodiversity and society concerns transfer of knowledge to society where this, for example, this COVID-19 lab would enter. We are uh, aligned with the ideas to fulfill the SDGs, the United Nations SDGs, of course. And uh, here are, is an example uh, of which is SDGs we would fulfill. Finally, we also have a line which is biodiversity and management of genetic resources, and that concerns the Nagoya Protocol. We are the authority which gives permission according to the Nagoya Protocol in the Misiones province. So, next slide. So, reflecting on this, uh, we have made a lot of thinking and we have come up with a biodiversity dream for La Latin America. And this is based, thank Partly to, I would like to thank Youssef for his input to the United Nations Scientific Summit meeting. And in the next slide, uh, the first step in this reflection is this meeting of Scientific uh, Summit, where we presented, which was titled Biodiversity, Forest, Health and Society. And uh, where you see here attracted a lot of attention within the province because the whole range of people you see there in the, on the picture are ministers of the local provincial government. So they were very interested in this. And what are our conclusions? Our conclusions from this meeting uh, is shown in the next slide. So we conclude that there are significant actions for biodiversity going on in uh, South America or Latin America, but they are performed in isolation. These isolated uh, efforts create havens or oases like Misiones, which is an isolated oasis or haven. And this is not nearly enough sufficient to preserve this biodiversity in Latin America. So Imbibio's vision, vision is to combine the isolated efforts in a synergistic interaction to promote a game changer in the protection and conservation and restoration of biodiversity. We want to make a game changer here by international collaborations, which will strengthen the global approach to bring comprehensive solution to biodiversity loss and our relationship to nature. And now on the next slide, if I remember right, should be the last slide. Thank you for your interest. Uh, any questions? And this is the Amy Bio team, which gives you a hello. And uh, this is the end picture of this scientific summit meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you Thank ever you so much. Ever so much. That is very inspiring what you do. And I, I agree the challenge obviously is uh, not to work in isolation, but to join forces. And again, I would um, like to think that the Enron community, our community can help you in doing that. I mean, I don't know, is your institute, for example, connected to the Argentinian NREN. I think it's in Ovaret, as far as you know. It's not. It's not it's because not. also it's so remote. And... Okay. Yeah, to my knowledge, it's not. Uh, this is a provincial mm -hmm. uh, provincial institute. We It's young, so we are currently trying to get 
how do you say, recognized by the, the National Institutes of Research. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, I would say this is a challenge in the sense that we want to remain provincial and should be recognized as such. And I understand the dilemma, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and hand in hand with what I just said, my colleague Chris also put a question here forward. Uh, what are your greatest challenges to acquire and analyze, uh, analyze data at the moment at your institute? I, I would I would quite simply say the greatest challenge today is hardware. Uh, essentially hardware in terms of connectivity mm -hmm. and uh, server capacity. Uh, I, I would say in terms of for bioinformatics and so on, that would be the, the probably the, 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 the bigger challenge. Then we have challenges in terms of equipment. Uh, we, we have that set up with biobank. So everyone who has been in a lab and has had a minus 80 freezer knows that each minus 80 freezer with all the, um, the bits and pieces is uh, $30,000 mm -hmm. US dollars. So if you want to pull up, um, let's say 15 freezers, it's a challenge. Uh, and and then you have to have the uh, the backup system. You have the electricity we have taken care of. We have the space. We have built a new lab, essentially for creating this biobank, which is going to store samples from the biodiversity in Misiones. Uh, and we have, uh, we have, we have some nitrogen, liquid nitrogen tanks, but we would like to expand that as well. But if you want to survey your equipment, you have to have software to do that. And mm -hmm. anyone who has gone into uh, to these software companies and asked for the prices, the, the cheapest one I've found so far lies around 30,000 euros. And I found up to 200,000 US dollars. So um, it's um, the, 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 the challenges are huge in terms of hardware. Funding, funding, yeah. funding this equipment and software. Yeah. So, but what is interesting for Enron, where Enron could do something, is help us with, with connectivity and. Uh, if anyone is involved in in in, uh, in server capacity and so on, that would be most welcome. And in terms of software, there is another question from Chris. Uh, are there uh, a fine or similar communities that could help build this software together with you? Is that an opportunity? Um, I'm not so sure that these kind of softwares for, for example, for biobank uh, surveillance and keeping um, in check the biobanks, uh, controlling that every freezer is okay, that you want to experiment on that. Uh, because we're going to have human samples, we have going to have samples from hospitals, we are going to so we need something which is validated by authorities. Um, otherwise, of course, we could we could say we we need we could build our own program. But you need to know where your samples are and how they are stored. So they are two softwares you need to have separate, and those need to be validated by by. By authorities. Otherwise, it's going to be. Uh, it, it, I, I don't take the risk. If you have hundred thousand samples, mm. 
and you don't know the background of them, of them, you don't know the history, you don't know where they are, they are. I I I I I can't I I can't foresee that. I prefer to to be absolutely sure. If, if, if I may uh, jump jump in, uh, the reason I was uh, asking is um, I'm aware I, I didn't have contacts myself, but I'm aware that there's a, uh, a um, bio bank in uh, Europe. Yeah. Um, in in Svalbard, which is an island uh, in the yeah. Arctic. Um, I know the it, it, sorry, the seed bank. Yes, the seed bank. Yeah, permafrost seed bank. Yeah. Yeah, and I just wondered whether they would be good to talk to in order to understand what their experiences were, because it sounds to me like that they would have similar experiences. Maybe you've already done this, and apologies for. We we saw there was um, a grant proposal for which ran out the fourteenth of November. Uh, we did not we became aware of it too late, but it's one of the things which I uh, will do. Essentially, now you mention it, Chris. Then it it, it gives me um, a motivation to to write to them and see if they can help us. I mean, if if it helps, I can put you in touch with the um, the Enren in Norway, who yes. might contact them in order that would, to facilitate a, an introduction. Yeah, that would be absolutely great. We'll talk afterwards. Yep. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much again. Very, very impressive. Okay, so our next speaker now is a compatriot of Yusuf, um, Anasal, uh, I don't know if I pronounce it properly, Kashpe. Um, he is head of systems administration at the German Jordanian University. Pardon, say that again. Can you repeat your name so that I don't get it wrong again? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you hear me, please? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Okay. Well, hello? in any case, yeah, can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, uh, hello. Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I can hear you, but sometimes the, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm Anas al Kasaspe from German Jordanian University. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for, the, the, I mean, like for letting me uh, to uh, share my experience with cloud security. Uh, 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 Today, I would like to talk about, uh, uh, um, uh, today I, I, I would like to talk about uh, 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 public infrastructure as a use cases for securing uh, Microsoft cloud systems. Uh, I would like to share first my screen. Uh, once, please. Yeah, uh, can you see my presentation right now? Not at the moment. Hello? Anas, Anas we can't hear it. Uh, we can't see it at the moment. Uh, Mr. Anas, I can share your presentation. Yeah, um, uh, I already yeah. shared the presentation. It's loading. Ah, so for the sake of time, let's have Sarah share uh, your yeah, slide and she, you just tell her to advance to the next uh, slide because uh, we are uh, about to uh, lose time. So, Sarah, go ahead. Um. 
uh, I just uploaded. Uh, okay. I mean, if you could just tell our colleague Sarah when you want the slide to be moved to the next one. Have we lost Anas now? I can't see him anymore. Shall we, in the meantime, move on and give Nesren the floor? Unless Anas, Anas is able to come back now. I think I would, I would uh, move up. <laughs> oh, here we are. No. Hello, is, everybody. Nisren, yes. If we yes. move on to you, um, so you are you were supposed to be our last speaker, not going to be. So you are also like Anes uh, from uh, the Systems Administration Department of the German Jordanian University, and your research experience is in the field of HPC cloud benchmarking, which is also the title of your presentation. So, Nisreen, the floor is yours. Okay. If you Hello. could just go into the presentation view and not in the notes view here. Okay. This is my presentation. Slideshow, if you go to slideshow. Or... I guess the problem with share screen is that we sometimes it's not easy to select which which screen. So yes. if you go to slideshow, then you will need to go to which to screen the other or... which screen, yes. Uh Nestrin, I can share your presentation. Then you just tell Sarah when to move forward, please. We can't hear anything. Nes Nesrin, are you unmuted? Yusuf, I can't hear you either. Mr. Ian, if you, if you hear us, please uh, just uh, start your presentation and ask uh, uh, Sarah to move ahead with your slides. Can you please start your, your presentation? I see you muted, so you, please unmute and start your presentation. Sarah will move your slides uh, forward. So I, um, hello everybody, uh, this hello. is uh, Nisreen Akhtarkawi, uh, Library System Admin at uh, German Jordanian University. I'm really glad uh, to have this uh, chance to show you my uh, research today, 
titled by Benchmark HPC in the cloud. So let's uh, get this started. Mm -hmm. This presentation will cover the introduction, a cloud service provider, and uh, a message passing interface and benchmark tools, high performance computing cluster scenarios, benchmarking the cluster, benchmark result, and uh, conclusions. Uh, this work covers implementing and benchmarking the high performance cluster in the cloud, the uh, cloud service provider selection, message passing interface selection, implementing HPC cluster, and benchmarking high performance computer cluster scenario. Uh, the next slide, please. I choose uh, the best cloud providers and different hypervisor type. Uh, I based on the uh, public cloud service provider were selected based on Gartner report, the best infrastructure as a service, and the hypervisor type uh, brand, and uh, selected uh, the public cloud service provided are Amazon uh, EC2, Zen, and Microsoft Azure Hypervi and Google Computing Engine. KVM. And now I'm going to go about the MDI and benchmark tool. Okay. So in um, the message passing interface implementation, selection was based on uh, first uh, the best implementation status, MDI uh, version 3.1, and second, open source implementation. The open MDI and MDI uh, CH are uh, chosen in the work uh, for implementation. So I choose the Open MPI and the MPI CH. So the next slide. Mm -hmm. The benchmark tools were selected in this work. All of them are open source. The NAS parallel benchmark and the multi-zone NAS parallel benchmark, the high performance limb pack using uh, message passing interface with MKL, Math Kernel Library and uh, Atlas, and uh, we I use the Intel uh, uh, Math Kernel uh, Library uh, optimized limb pack. I'm going to um, talk about the high performance computing as a surface cluster scenario. Uh, before benchmarking the cluster, I propose two scenarios: one uh, for uh, one geographical location scenario and another one for the multiple geographical location scenario. In this scenario, the master node and compute node are hosted at the same cloud data center, same location accordingly, and the compute nodes uh, slabs are connected via high bandwidth. In this uh, slide, that's the multiple geographical location scenario. In this scenario, the master node and compute node are hosted at uh, the different cloud data center distributed over different countries. Accordingly, the compute node are uh, connected via uh, the internet. And this is... Mm -hmm. The benchmark cluster, uh, in this uh, research, I built the environment from the scratch. I, I configured the operating system CentOS on the three cloud providers. I installed the MBI CH and Open MBI, Intel MBI as a middleware, and C, C++, uh, Fortran, Intel as a compiler. Finally, I deployed the benchmark tools, uh, for example, NAS parallel benchmark uh, and uh, multi-zone NAS parallel benchmark, Intel, linear pack, high performance limb pack, and C3. After choosing MPI CH and Open MPI, I did a performance comparison using NAS parallel benchmark Fourier transform integer sort and the class C. The benchmark result in megaflops shows that the uh, MBI CH got better performance than uh, Open MBI. 
we run uh, the conjugate gradient uh, lower uh, upper and uh, impressing parallel uh, on the multiple geographical location scenario the benchmark result shows uh, that the performance uh, benchmark becomes slower when uh, more nodes are uh, involved because communication intensive but for impressingly parallel, the performance becomes better. This is because this uh, benchmark does not depend on the bandwidth. Here in this slide, the benchmark result for one uh, geographical location scenario becomes better once the nodes are added. That's on one geographical location scenario. And for multi-zone, uh, the NASPRL benchmark, the processing speed in megaflops for each of the three cloud service provider was getting better when the number of uh, CPUs uh, by open MD memory threads less than or equal to the total number of cluster. Uh, total number of uh, CPUs, 64-bit uh, in the world. In addition, uh, uh, this is uh, to uh, NASPRL benchmark. I run uh, uh, HPL benchmark on the three cloud provider using Intel MPI, MKL library, math library, and MPI CH Atlas library. The results are shown uh, in the current slide. The cluster processing speed uh, goes down when, uh, the, uh, when increasing the cluster uh, node. Mm -hmm. I run Intel uh, MKL optimized Limbag uh, benchmark on one of uh, the compute nodes, individual node. I noticed that uh, Microsoft Azure uh, got the best result. This is because Intel has optimized uh, its uh, MKL for Microsoft Windows. In addition, the Hyper-V virtualized each thread uh, to core inside the virtual uh, memory or virtual machine other than uh, Google, which use uh, KVM hypervisor and Amazon, which is uh, use uh, Zen hypervisor. So uh, now uh, I'm going to talk about the discussion and conclusion in general for this uh, research. Mm -hmm. The uh, on, in one geographical location scenario, MBI CH got better performance than Open MBI for NASPRL benchmark. And in multiple uh, geographical location scenario, building an uh, HBC cluster on multiple uh, geographical location on the cloud is not efficient because the performance of the cluster becomes slower as the cluster node and uh, CPUs per core increase. And in NASPRL benchmark, the benchmark processing speed uh, for uh, 64 uh, CPU cluster on the three cloud were varying. The processing speed mainly depends on the interconnect bandwidth and uh, between the cluster node and the uh, hypervisor type. The uh, uh, NASPRL benchmark uh, multi-zone version and the processing speed uh, for each of the three cloud service provider was getting better when the number of uh, CPUs per uh, open uh, memory threads less than or equal to the total number of cluster CPU. And in HPL benchmark, the processing speed of uh, giga in uh, gigaflops using Intel MPI MKL is better than MPI CH Atlas. The cluster processing speed goes down when increasing the cluster node. In HBL benchmark, we got a high processing speed in gigaflops whenever benchmark an individual cluster node using either Intel optimized impact benchmark or HBL benchmark. With Intel MPI MKL, but when benchmarking individual cluster node using HBL benchmark with um, and the ICH Atlas, the resulting in gigaflops were around 15% uh, less than is because of the compatibility with the Intel process. And uh, on the other hand, the cluster efficiently is decreased whenever adding more cluster node to the 
HPL benchmark. This is caused by the interconnect bandwidth between the cluster node. And in the next slide, the uh, high performance computing cluster performance mainly depends on the CPU performance and uh, interconnect. Accordingly, HPC cluster and application could be offered as a service in the cloud as HBC, uh, High Performance Computing as a Service. As, as a result of this uh, research, the cloud providers still need to offer better virtualized interconnect and uh, virtualized uh, InfiniBand and um, uh, right digital uh, memory access uh, since the benchmark result uh, showed a decrease in the processing speed when a computer node are added. Okay, this is my research and thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you very much, Nisreen. Thank you also very much for trying to address the gender balance, uh, balance on this panel here of speakers. <laughs> um, interesting research. And um, so what's next after the benchmarking? I want to also uh, maybe use another scenarios for the benchmark and extend my work, like uh, maybe use the uh, 128 uh, CPUs and mm -hmm. increase the RAM and I will try to, uh, yeah. okay. to continue with that benchmarking yes. exercise comparison. Okay. Yes. Thanks mm -hmm. ever so much. Thank you again for this is opportunity to sharing my uh, research result. Thank you. That's Yusuf's doing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nisreen. I don't know if we still have Anas among us. I, earlier on, I couldn't see him among the speakers anymore. Oh, here he is. Excellent. Anas? If you'd like to uh, give your presentation now, if you're ready. So, uh, presenting your case study on public key infrastructure in the cloud and where you're going to address security considerations in storing sensitive and personal data in the cloud. I'm not sure whether he is here. Actually, he just sent an email that he had a problem with the internet. Oh, I see. Well, see. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. Hadia, Hadia, can you uh, arrange with him if he can join by phone and guide him? Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, we'll see if there is an uh, uh, other question also. Are there any? Yeah, are there any additional questions from the Hi, audience or among the speakers to your co-speakers? Take the opportunity. I mean, we have already identified some follow-on actions between some of the speakers and between. Asrin and some of the speakers and the audience, but take the opportunity to get some clarification, some additional information while we wait for Nas to get ready. Um, if I may, I've, uh, rather than typing out the question, it might be easier. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yes, hundred uh, percent. So, Off you go, Chris. So my my questions to uh, Nasreen, uh, if I may, um, could you explain why you chose Atlas? as the benchmark uh, for your experiments? Yes, I. Uh, that's because uh, the open source and the open library. So that's, I use that. Uh, and also based on the reports that, like Gartner and uh, other reports, that's uh, the best uh, library, open, as an open source library, I, I mean. And, and do you find that um, with the benchmarking uh, exercise that you're going through with the various different cloud uh, provider or HPC cloud providers, um, are you uh, planning to look at the data movement, like the uh, the egress 
um, between those different cloud uh, servers, or is it just specifically to test the uh, the performance uh, and benchmark one one against the other? Yes, of course. I benchmark everything: the memory benchmark and the input output benchmark, and the, the like NAS parallel benchmark, and uh, yeah, everything. Mm. Oh, great! Thanks very much. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, let me also congratulate uh, Nisreen for uh, her research and uh, for being with us. Uh, thank you for joining. And uh, thank you. I hope Anas will be able to join. Uh, Hadi is trying to help him. Um, I don't know what is the, was the technical problem that they, uh, he is. There was an internet outage. There was an internet outage when he started his presentation. Yeah, yeah, so. but, uh, but for now, uh, he, the system is blocking him, so it's it's now at, at our court. So it's he, at Hadia's court, and uh, so she's uh, trying to see how she can handle that. Meanwhile, uh, I maybe the chair of the session can, uh, if you have, can moderate any kind of questions or any kind of discussions until he joins. I mean, I invited um, questions from the audience. Um, there was already some interaction going on and uh, questions from, and uh, a question also towards Ms. Rain. I particularly found the session very informative and uh, I congratulate you, sir, also on aligning this, uh, well, this speaker panel up because uh, it gives a very, very diverse picture of uh, user communities, their needs, their challenges, their, also their achievements, and where we potentially can all join forces and learn from each other. And that's what the purpose of these sessions are. When, when you see how some user communities work, it might inspire others, and one thing leads to another. So that's why I always like this application-focused sessions at conferences. And, yeah, I, I uh, actually, actually, uh, Helga asked, uh, I uh, offered her uh, to see which session does she like to, to chair, and she selected this session because it's our passion to see uh, research uh, engagement, how, and we can, how, how can we collaborate and how, how can we address the needs of the research communities and education communities also and uh, to be part of the science engagement uh, around the world. So we covered uh, various uh, issues and var uh, various dimensions of uh, uh, starting from Chris. Uh, we are missing uh, uh, Jawad Al-Kharraz. Uh, we will be talking about energy mm -hmm. and uh, so that he will be about uh, around the region, but uh, unfortunately he's unable. To, there is a ministerial visit at the at his center, but I hope he can uh, do his presentation tomorrow in one of the sessions. So uh, for now, if Anas in, uh, is unable to join, I will leave the floor to Helga to close the session. Uh, yes. But for that, I want to invite you to attend tomorrow. Tomorrow also, also we have very, very, very good program, uh, two sessions. Both of them will uh, discuss uh, open science, uh, open access and open, open data. But in the, uh, the first session will focus mostly on policies and uh, strategies. And, uh, and the second session will just, uh, will talk about practices, uh, uh, Platform mainly, I think, uh, how 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 can uh, open science comes to reality to practice as well? It comes through services. Among the, the first one uh, service could be the open science uh, infrastructure uh, like uh, European Open Science Cloud uh, and other platforms and so on. Uh, so for this purpose, uh, I invite you also to come tomorrow and uh, attend. Uh, is Anas around? I can't see him. No, I can't see him either. Uh, Yusuf, might there be a possibility to squeeze Anas in tomorrow? 
Yeah, yeah, you? I think. Uh, yes, if we could do that. If, he, if he's able to come tomorrow, then I, I will try to facilitate uh, maybe five minutes or so for tomorrow. But yes, for today, I think we have to close. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very, very much for all your contributions. For, and the audience for staying with us for two hours, but I'm sure everyone really appreciated uh, the inputs and the visions here as well, and the quest also to collaborate. So thank you ever so much again for everything, for your contributions, and I hope you will join EH tomorrow as well, as you said, point out where the focus will be on open science. So have a very good evening or good morning for, for Andres. <laughs> um, and um, I hope to see you very soon. Thanks ever so much. Bye now. Thank you all. Thank you. And see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.